Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me now? Thank you very much. I'll shout. Can. Okay. Yeah, I think now they can hear me. Right? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's my uh, grandissimo piacere to be here. And uh, what I'm going to share with you today is uh, some uh, data and work on dyslexia, on developmental dyslexia. And I'm going to look a little bit about the types of dyslexia that exist and how we should diagnose them and then how we can help people who have these kinds of dyslexia. So I actually I want to start with some examples, okay? When we look at this, uh, at this uh, slide, you can see in the red the different, different types of dyslexia. When we, let's start with the first line. There are people who find it very difficult to read the words torta, lardo, allegria, but it's not uh, difficult for them to read tavolo and università. Okay? Other people find it difficult to read dal, perché, inverno, but read well mela, forchetta. Other people, other types of dyslexia, have problems reading Modena and Benetton, but can read Ki and Studi. And yet other types of dyslexia have problems with sorriso, scambiare, and venire. Okay? Now, there, first of all, we see that there are differences in the types of words that are difficult for different people. But the important part is looking at the types of errors that, are, that they are making when they try to read these words. And this is very informative for us to understand what kind of dyslexia we are talking about and how we can help these people. So let's look at the types of errors that they make. The first one, instead of reading torta, reads trotta. Instead of lardo, ladro. Instead of allegria, allergia. Okay, what kind of error do they make here? Right? They, make, they transpose the letters. They make errors of letter position, right? So why don't they make errors in universita? Because there is no such word as universita. Right? So here we can see that the type, the, the type of dyslexia relates to the position of letters within the word. And therefore, words that, in which when you change the order of the letters, you get another existing word, is hard, are harder for them than words like universita, in which you don't really need to know the position of, it, of each letter and still you get the right word. So this is one type of dyslexia, letter position dyslexia. Let's look at the second type of dyslexia. This is someone who cannot read dal, perché, and inverno. Let's look at the types of errors that they make. Instead of reading dal, he says, I don't know. Okay? Instead of reading perché, he says, poiche, siccome. And instead of reading inverno, he says, pioggia. In this case, what we see here is that some, someone who has to imagine the word before reading it aloud. So try to imagine dal. Try to imagine perché. Right? This is something that we cannot have a visual imagination of, and therefore it is hard for him to say it. When he imagines inverno, he probably in imagines rain. So he says pioggia. Right? Now, mela and forchetta are easy to imagine, so he is able to read them aloud. So here we have another type of dyslexia. It's called uh, deep dyslexia. Why is it called deep dyslexia? Because we go through the deep meaning of each word in order to read it aloud. What about the third one? The third one, the types of errors that he makes are instead of reading Modena, he re reads Modena. And instead of reading Benetton, he reads Benetton. Okay. So what he does here, he knows the letters. He knows how each letter sounds, but he doesn't have the whole, the whole word. And therefore, he doesn't know that the whole word is Modena and not Modena. This is called surface dyslexia. Of course, you cannot make this error with, with key, because key has only one stress position. What about the final one? The final one reads sorriso as riso, 
scambiare e scambiare, and venire e finire. What is common to all the types of errors that he makes? He makes errors on the left side of the words. This is a type of dyslexia, it's called neglect dyslexia, or left neglect dyslexia. This is a type of uh, dyslexia that is very, very thoroughly tested and researched, studied in Italy. Uh, the, the best work on neglect dyslexia is done in Italy uh, by a long list of uh, neuropsychologists. And the, 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 this dyslexia causes difficulties in reading the beginning, in Italian, the beginning of the words. Okay? So they either omit the letters or substitute the, the letters. So we can already see four different types of dyslexias that differ with respect to which words are more difficult, and they also differ with respect to the types of errors that these dyslexics make. Okay? So what I'm going to talk about today is just, I'm going just to tell you that there are 17 types of dyslexia. I'm not going to talk about all 17 types. And I'm going to talk about dyslexia as a reading, as a deficit in reading. And as we discussed yesterday with Elisabetta, of course, or, and, and with Francesca, a deficit in reading, of course, might lead to other difficulties. Children might have a lot of frustration. They might not like to go to school because they have a deficit in reading. But what I'm going to talk about today is the basic deficit that relates to reading. So there are 17 types of dyslexia, each one with different error types, each one with different words that uh, are more difficult for them. And I'm going to ask what are the characteristics of each type of dyslexia? How do we diagnose them in the best way to expose this type of uh, dyslexia? And what is the appropriate treatment for each type of dyslexia? Finally, I will, I will ask from, uh, in different points, what is the relation between dyslexia and language? Okay, so in order to understand dyslexia, the, uh, the idea is that each type of dyslexia results from a deficit in a different component of the reading model. So I'm going to say a little bit about the different, about the reading model, the stages I'll give you some time to take your telefonini and take a picture of this model, but I might also send the model uh, so we can put it on the website or something. Uh, what are the stages that we pass through from the moment we see a written word until we understand the word and until we are able to say the word aloud? So the very first stage is visual analysis. If we see the word uh, lardo, then we know that there is an L, A, R, D, and O, okay? We don't know the names of the letters, we don't know the sounds of the letters in this very, very early stage of visual analysis, but we know the abstract identity of the letters. Now the question is, is it enough for us to know that there is L and A and D and R and O in the word? Of course it's not enough, because then we might read it as ladro, right? So we. It's not enough for us to know what the identity of the letters are. We also want to know what the order of the letters in the word are. Right? So we want to know the relative order of the letters within the word. And this is another thing that this visual analysis system is doing. It's, it identifies the letters, and then it identifies the position of each letter. Another thing that this visual analysis system does is allowing us its kind of attentional a mechanism that allows us, when we see more than one word at the same time, allows us to focus on one word and not to see the other words that are around us. Otherwise, and I, and I think those of, those of you who work with children see it a lot of times, let us jump between words. You know, all these children who read with the finger and who cover the, the words around uh, the word that they are reading, it's because let us jump between the words for them. So. Uh, we need to have, in order to have normal reading, we need to be able to focus on one word and attenuate, uh, disregard the other words around this word. So this is another thing that the visual analysis system is doing. So we have letter identification, letter position, and letter to word binding. At this point, we only know what letters they are and what, are their, what is their relative position within the word. But it's still, of course, not enough, because when we read, we want to understand the words that we are reading, and we want to be able to read them aloud. 
So the next stage is the orthographic input lexicon. This is a lexicon that includes the words that we know uh, how they are written, right? So these are words that we, after we read each word several times, they go into this kind of lexicon, lexicon of written words. At this point, we know, for example, uh, that a key with a C-H-I is a word that we know, but key with a K and an I is not a word in our lexicon, right? So we are able to make lexical decisions. And this orthographic lexicon is connected to two components. It is connected to meaning. So when we see the word uh, you know, torta, we go to the, from the lexicon to the semantics in order to understand the word. This is where the meaning of the word is. And we also go to the phonological output lexicon. The phonological output lexicon is the component that hold, holds the sounds of the words. So in this point, we can know that the word torta uh, has, the con has consonants t, r, t, and has the, f the, the vowels o and a. Okay? So this is what the phonological output lexicon does. And then we go to a stage of phonemic buffer. This is a short-term memory component that holds the phonemes until we are able to say them aloud. So this allows us to read words that we know. What, what happens if we have to read a word in a second language, in a lingua straniera? Or if we have to read a word that we don't know yet? How do we do that? In order to read words that are new to us, we have to go from letter to its sound, right? So for example, if we want to read the word graphime, and it's not in our lexicon yet, we know that G sounds like G, and R sounds like R, and then we do conversion between letters and sounds, between graphemes and phonemes. So this, this uh, route that goes through the, lexic the, through the lexicons is called the direct le lexical route. This route is called the semantic route. And the route that goes from grapheme to phoneme is called the sublexical route because we go in, a, in a components that are smaller than words, sublexical, below, lexic, below the word level. Now, the important point about dyslexia, and now we go back to dyslexia from the normal reading model, is that a deficit in each of these components can give rise to a different dyslexia. Okay? And these are the dyslexias that we currently know of, the developmental dyslexias that we know. So each of these components can be selectively impaired and give rise to a different type of dyslexia. So uh, until now we were talking about impairments in these functional components. But we can also talk about impairments in the brain that give rise to the different types of dyslexia. And in several, uh, uh, types of, uh, several uh, uh, studies that have been done with acquired dyslexias, so people who following brain damage had problems with reading, people were able to identify areas in the brain that are related to some of these components. So for example, remember the grapheme to phoneme conversion? The grapheme to phoneme conversions allows people to read new words or uh, words in a different language. So when you look at people who have brain damage and who cannot, can no longer read new words, they are people who are impaired in the grapheme to phoneme conversion. You can see that their deficit, where their deficit in the brain is. In this case, it is in Broadman areas 39 and 40. So, uh, and now there are some, uh, some uh, studies trying to look at developmental dyslexia and see whether there are, it is the same areas as in acquired dyslexia. But the important point is that we can identify different components of reading and they are located in different places in the brain. And therefore, we see different dyslexias. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is just try together with you to do some thinking experiment. And later, I'm going to go through uh, to, to present to you some of these dyslexias. But in general, let's think about someone who's, who has a problem in the lexical route. So this is someone who could 
uh, who could, cannot read from the orthographic lexicon to the phonological lexicon. Let's think about what would be difficult for this person to read. First of all, let's think, will he be able to read new words? Hmm? He will be able to read new words, right? Because new words are read via grapheme to phoneme conversion. So what should be difficult for them? Should be, uh, in English, when we think about English, it, uh, they should have problems with irregular words. So if you think about a word like listen, that is written L-I-S-T-E-N, they might read it listen, right? Or if you think about a word like talk, T-A-L-K, they might read it as talk, right? So they might read uh, the silent letters they might read them aloud if they read via grapheme to phoneme conversion. Let's think about Italian, right? We, we try to think about the relation between dyslexia and different languages. What would happen in Italian? In Italian, there are not, not so many irregular words. So how can we see this dyslexia in Italian? One way to look uh, is to look at words like Modena. So if we look so this is why I think, this is why the conference is in Modena. So, so we are able to identify this type of dyslexia. Modena has three syllables, right? So we, the uh, person who has this dyslexia will be able to read mo, de, na, but they will not know where to put the stress. Is it Modena, Modena, or Modena, right? And therefore, in, with these kind of uh, words, even, even in Italian, we are able to see this kind of dyslexia that is called surface dyslexia. Why is it called surface dyslexia? Because they read on the surface from graphene to phoneme conversion. Another problem that these people might have is understanding. Because, for example, if you think about, in English, about the word which, W-I-T-C-H, they, they do not know if this is which, the, the woman who does magic, or which, the question, uh, and probably most of us don't either, but uh, uh, because it's a, it's a second language for us. But when someone reads via grapheme to phoneme conversion, they cannot distinguish between homophones. So this is something that will be problematic also in Italian when you, when you are able to find a homophone here and there. Okay, what about people who have a problem in the grapheme to phoneme conversion? This is called phonological dyslexia. What will their problems be? They will be able to read Modena if it is in their lexicon, but they will not be able to read new words. So let's start actually by thinking about people who were able to read at some point, and then they had a brain injury that caused them not to be able to read new words. Then they will be able to read all the words that are already in their lexicon, right? But they will not be able to read new words or to acquire new names of neurotransmitters if they, read, if they learn neuroscience or uh, new names of uh, researchers. But now let's think about children who have developmental phonological dyslexia. What this means to their ability to acquire reading. This is much more severe, right? Because when children acquire reading, they acquire reading via the grapheme to phoneme conversion route. So if they are unable to read via the grapheme to phoneme conversion route, what they have to do is find a way to put whole words into their lexicon without going through grapheme to phoneme conversion. These are the children that we see that only acquire reading at the age of eight or nine. And then once they have the words in their lexicon, they are fine. And then when do they find again this, uh, uh, this difficulty? when they, they start learning English or some other second language, right? Because then when they start learning English, again, they don't have the words in English in their lexicon, and then they have to read via grapheme to phoneme conversion, and they cannot. So these children are children that every time they try to learn a new subject or a new language, they again meet their difficulty and, and are unable to read the new words. Okay, now this is becoming more complicated. What about people who have problems both in the grapheme to phoneme conversion and in the connection between the two lexicon? Can you imagine at all how they, they will be able to read? The only way for them to read is via meaning, okay? So they identify the letters 
and the position of the letters. They go to the lexicon, they say, okay, I know this, uh, this word, inverno, right? And then they go to the meaning and they imagine inverno. And then they say what they imagine. So it could be rain, it could be clouds, it could be cold, right? So if they read aloud, they actually read aloud something that is semantically related to the word that they are reading. And this is called deep dyslexia, as I told you, because they go through the deep meaning of the words. So for example, just to give you some examples of a person who has semantic errors, who has deep dyslexia, instead of reading gift, they would read present, so synonyms, round, circle, style, dress, sorry, sad, off, they might say, I don't know, I can't read it. Why? Because they cannot imagine it. Because becomes four, and jacket, this is one of my uh, patients, he, he was 34, and he saw the word jacket, and he said, jeans. So probably he was imagining his own jackets that are always from jeans, nothing, nothing else. And he was, so he was imagining a jacket, and then he said jeans, because he was naming a different property of the, of the image that he had. Okay, so this is deep dyslexia. Now let's think again about the relation between deep dyslexia in this case and learning a new language. What would someone who, try, who is Italian and speaks Italian at home and every day and he tries to learn English? When he would try to read a word in English, a word is written in English, what would he do? He would go through semantics and say the word in Italian. So we are, for example, we are working in Israel, we are working with people who speak Arabic and Hebrew. They speak Arabic as a first language. And then when they study Hebrew, when they try to read Hebrew, they read the words in Hebrew and they say it in Arabic. Okay? So again, you can see a, a very close connection between languages, between acquiring a second language, and between the effects of dyslexia. But it is important to see that different dyslexias give rise to different types of errors. Right? So in this case, reading in a completely different language. This is deep dyslexia. What about errors in the very first stage? If someone cannot do letter identification, what types of errors will he make? He will substitute letters, right? And he will omit letters. What about letter position? How will he read uh, torta, trota, torta? Right? Allegria, allergia. If there is a problem in letter position, the letters will be identified correctly, but the position will be incorrect. What about letter to word binding? If someone can identify the letters and can identify the position of the letters within the word, but cannot know which letters belongs to which words, in this case, what kinds of errors will we see? Letters jumping between words. Right? Okay. Now another point is that uh, when we see ch children and adolescents with, and students with, the, with dyslexia, it might be developmental, so it might be from birth, due to genetic reasons or other nutritional reasons, but it might also be acquired. Sometimes we work, unfortunately, with children who have head, tra head traumas, who riding on a bike, or children who had accidents, uh, or children who had brain tumors or removals of brain tumors, they also show dyslexia that, have, that is very, very similar to, those, to the dyslexia of the developmental type. So in fact, when we look at the types of uh, dyslexia that we have, that we see after brain damage and dyslexia that we see from birth, these dyslexias are almost identical. And therefore, I'm going to talk about them together, but today my focus is on, on developmental dyslexia, but you should remember that it's quite uh, similar to what you might see with uh, students who arrive with a learning disability that is uh, caused by, for example, by an accident. Okay. When we look at the one more point about the relation between reading and language. When we look at this uh, model, what we see is that, look at the orange parts. The, or the, the orange parts are parts that are in use also by the language system. So for example, think about when we want to say a word like uh, 
we want to say the word computer, okay? So we have the concept of a computer, and then we go to some semantic lexicon, lexicon of meanings. We go from there to the phonological lexicon that we talked about already, the lexicon that includes the sounds of the words, and then we go to the buffer that holds the, the, the working memory component. So you see that even when we want to say a word, we use the same components. What does it mean about people with dyslexia uh, and the relation between dyslexia and language? And this is, I think, an important point. Some, there are a lot of arguments about whether dyslexia is also a problem in language. Is there a comorbidity between language and dyslexia? What is the relation between linguistic impairments, language impairments, and reading impairments. And here you can look at the, this model and see that there are components that are not related to language uh, at all. So for example, the, autographic, the visual analysis stage, those who have problems in the position of letters, it's not a language problem, it's a reading problem. Those who have problems in the autographic input lexicon, they have a reading problem, not a language problem. But those who are impaired in the orange parts might have both language problems and reading problems. Think, for example, about someone who has a problem in the phonological output lexicon. Of course, when they try to say words, they will make phonological errors. So instead of saying table, they would say dable or table, right? But when they try to read, they cannot read via the, the lexical root. So they will have to read via grapheme to phoneme conversion. So here you can see a very a principled and very close relation between reading and language. So the important point is that when, once you know the different dyslexias, once you know the different impairments in language, and once you know these components, you can see that some of them are related to language and others are not related to language. But it is important to know that, for example, if a child has a problem in the phonemic output buffer, they would have problems in reading but they would also have problems in phonological working memory, in remembering numbers, in saying words in the right, in, in the right order of phonemes. So we would, in this case, we would expect errors both in speaking and in reading. And this is, again, why it is so important to identify the exact type of dyslexia. Because if we want to treat the person with dyslexia, we want to know exactly what are the components that are weak, that need support. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit to present to you three, three dyslexias in the different components of reading. How am I doing with time? Perfect. Okay, so we said that the first, uh, you already took picture of this, but it was a bit smaller. This, these are the different functions of the visual analysis system. And the visual analysis system, we said, has three functions. Letter identification, letter position within the word, and letter to word binding. And we said that each of these components can be selectively impaired. Okay, so we might see problems in letter identification, problems in letter position, and problems in letter to word binding. I'm going to start with letter position. Letter position dyslexia, the dyslexia that affects specifically the ability to code the position of letters within the words. What will a person who has letter position dyslexia uh, do when he has to read a word? He will make letter transpositions. So if he doesn't know what the order of the letters in the word are, he might read this as trota, but probably he would read it as torta. Right? Because he knows all the letters in the word, but he doesn't know their relative order. Uh, this dyslexia ha can happen following brain damage to uh, occipital temporal, occipital parietal areas, but it can also happen in a developmental form, and we now work with more than 200 children who have this kind of letter position dyslexia. You could see different percentages of transpositions. It could, it could get from 15% to more than 40%. Now think about a child or a student who has 43% errors of letter position. It is 
almost impossible to understand text, right? It is almost impossible to, un to, to read. And these people do not read for pleasure. It's not a pleasure for them to read. I was, uh, I was asking one of, one of these uh, kids who came to me to my lab, and I was asking her, what do you read for pleasure? And she said, pleasure? Reading is not pleasure. So, so you might think again about the implications of uh, reading disorders. And in, in this case, she doesn't read for pleasure. She doesn't increase her vocabulary. She doesn't know many words. But her problem is not in vocabulary. Her problem is in letter position and coding. Now, when we look at the errors that they make, when we compare middle migration, so migration of letters in the middle of the word, and exterior migration, migrations of letters in the beginning or the end of the word, we see that there are much, much more errors in the middle. It's almost exclusively errors in the middle of the word and not of the first and the last letters. Okay, this is just a study with 52 individuals with this letter position dyslexia. When we compare the numbers of errors that they make in the middle or in the exterior letters, you can see that there are significantly more errors in the middle. What about reading comprehension? What would happen if we ask this person, we tell this person, don't read aloud at all. We don't want you to read aloud. Just tell me what the word means. Okay? Why is it important? Because we know that there are children who make errors uh, when they speak just because they have a problem in the phonological output buffer. Right? They might say tota in, instead of trota just because something is wrong with their pronunciation or with their speech production. So what we want to do is ask them not to read aloud and just to explain to us what the word means. So this is a, a child, an Australian child. Uh, that we asked him to say what diary means, and he says something from a cow. Why? Because dairy, when he does letter position error, dairy means uh, something from a cow. What about could? We asked him to just to look at the word could and to say what it means, and he said something that brings rain. Why is it something that brings rain? Cloud, right? So he was reading it with a letter position error, and he understood it the way he read it. Again, there is a close connection between comprehension, language in this case, and reading. And parties, this is hard. He said parties, they are very brave. They are robbers of the sea. What is it? Pirates, right, pirates. So he saw the word parties, the letters transposed, and he thought he was seeing pirates. So he was defining pirates. So in this case, we see that it's not only a problem when we ask a child to read aloud. It, because it's in the very first stage of reading, it affects also the way they understand words. OK, so we say it affects the way they read words. It means that you know, there are many children who come with a, uh, with a diagnosis of reading comprehension problems. Right? When we hear that a child has reading comprehension problems, we don't know how to help him or her. Right? We need to know why he has problems in, in reading comprehension. And in this case, what we need to do is dis distinguish, when we look at reading comprehension, between is it a problem in reading or is it a problem in comprehension. Right? If it is a problem in reading, for example, letter position dyslexia, we, we should treat reading. If it is a problem in comprehension, we should hear it, we should find it also when the child hears the word or hears the sentence. And of course, in this case, treatment should be completely different. Another important point here that will become also important for diagnosis is the reliance on lexical knowledge. If, is what I say a word or not? Maybe many of you got this email with this text claiming that according to a research at Cambridge University, it doesn't matter in what order the letters in the word are. Now, this is only partially true because here all the words are words that if you change the order of the letters in the word, you, get, you don't get any other word. But what would happen if, if, if this te text included trota and ladro and allergia? Right? In this case, we would not be able to read the text. 
So in this case, what we need to do is distinguish between words like fruta. If you take the word fruta, you can't rearrange the letters to get another existing word, the middle letters to get another existing word. So even if you have no idea, you just know that there is F and R and U and T and T and A, you will get the right word, right? However, if we take the word trota, then if we know that there is T and R and O and T and A, we don't know if it's trota or tota. And this uh, forms a very important difference between migratable words like fruta, that if, you, if the letters migrate, they don't give rise to any other word, and trota. And this is very important for diagnosis because if we want to be able to uh, identify letter position dyslexia in a child, we have to be able to, we have to present words that are migratable. Okay? So if we, for example, uh, compared with the 65 participants that we work with, migratable words and non-migratable words. So non-migratable words like fruta and migratable words like trota. And what you find is that they almost never make errors when the change of letters will not make another word. Right? So they do not make errors in fruta. They do make errors in trota. And this means that once, if we want to diagnose correctly letter position dyslexia, we have to present migratable words. Otherwise, we will miss this dyslexia. And I think this is what happens with many children around the world. People, the children, the parents know that something is wrong. The child says, something is wrong. I can't read very well. But when they go and do these standard tests that do not include migratable words, they say, OK, you are fine. You don't have any problem. And imagine how frustrating it must be for a child who says something is wrong with me and the, and the DSA uh, diagnoser says, you're fine. Nothing is wrong with you. So it is very important to choose the correct stimuli. So I, I created a little list for you. The, these are all migratable words in Italian. Now you can do a little, uh, a little play, a little game, and try to see what are the migratable, migration counterparts of these words. So for example, bordo, brodo, capra, carpa, lad, corpo, lardo, ovile. OK, so these words exist in Italian. So even in Italian, you need to encode the position of the letters. And once you give, the, you give children these words, you all of a sudden find that even in Italian, there is letter position dyslexia. You just have to know how to, how to diagnose it. Uh, one more word about diagnosis before I go to treatment of this dyslexia. In order to diagnose this dyslexia, it's also very, it's much better to test single words and not text. Why? Because if you have the word trota in a, in a sentence, a sentence that says, uh, I went to, uh, to fish and I found a trota, right? Then you will read it trota and not tota, right? However, if you see a single word, then you will be able to identify this uh, error. So it's much, much better to give lists of words rather than to give text. And here you can see the results of our patients. They had 25% errors in single words, but only 12% errors in text. Because the, they could compensate and use the text, and usually dyslexic children and adults are much better in using the text as a hints of what is really written in the text. So again, for diagnosis, give migratable words as single words. OK, and now the question is, uh, I'm Mm. I'll say just one word uh, about vision. Oftentimes, when, when we uh, see uh, children in our lab, these are children who have reading problems, someone told them, ah, you have a vision problem. You don't see very well. You have a, a focus, the focus of your eyes is incorrect, right? So, and then it's not dyslexia, it's a problem in vision. How do we know that it is really dyslexia and not a problem in, in in a visual problem, one way is to just present numbers. If it is a visual problem, then we expect problems also in numbers, right? If it is a dyslexia, not necessarily. So when we tested our patients with reading 
uh, with reading words compared to reading numbers, we see that they do not make errors in reading numbers. They do make errors in reading words. What it means is that really they have dyslexia, a deficit that is related to written words and not a general problem in vision. And it is important to distinguish because if it is a problem in seeing, in, visual, in vision, you want to give them glasses that will correct or uh, exercises to, to work on the focus of the eyes. If it is dyslexia, you work on a completely different thing. Okay, now I'm going to talk about treatment of this dyslexia and move to the next dyslexia. How do we help these children and adults? What can they do for themselves in order to read better if they do want to, to try and read? So we tried various things. We tried spacing between letters. We tried putting each letter in a different color and putting signs between letters. And we also tried to tell them, just move, the, move your hand letter by letter on the word. Now you can see that it's from right to left. It's because Hebrew is written from right to left. I guess that for Italian it might be better to tell them to read from left to right. So uh, the idea for, for uh, reading with the finger is that you allow them to point their attention to each letter separately instead of looking at the whole word together. And uh, in the beginning we thought maybe the colors will be best because it will be fun and they will have different colors for different letters. But then when we see how many errors they make, we see that with colors, for each letter a different color, they make the most errors. So what you see here in the figure is the percentage of errors that they make. The left column, the yellow one, is the baseline. How many errors they make without any, uh, any kind of manipulation. On the right side, you see the colored letters. Why do they make so many errors when they see each letter in a different color? Because what they need to do is not only at this point, they not only need to connect the position with the letter, they also need to connect the position with the letter and with the color. So you actually add more complexity to what they need to do. So in fact, for them, it's much better to have all the letters in the same color, the same just not to confuse them with another feature. What is the best way to treat them? And if you wanted to ask, you know, if you hope, if, okay, I'll say about me, I really, really hope that something, that the thing that will be helpful for them would be something that they can use themselves, that they don't need a teacher or a parent to help them. And what can they use themselves? The finger. And indeed, this was the most useful technique. And think how simple it is. You don't need computers and earphones. You just need to tell the child, just read with your finger. Look, put your finger on each letter and you will read better. So when you compare the, the numbers of errors that they make when they read with, uh, with the finger, you see that they have, where is it? Sorry? You see that they have significantly fewer errors when they read with the finger. Another thing that I know that in Italy is not very common, but in Israel and in the United States it's very common, is Ritalina, right, methylphenidate. I know that in Italy people don't rush to give methylphenidate to, peop to children with disabilities. In Israel it's very, very common. It's so common that a parent can go to the neurologist and say, my child has problems in school and he will get Ritalina without even, the, even if the neurologist doesn't see the child, they get Ritalin. So it is relevant to see, uh, Ritalin is useful in some types of ADHD, right, in AD, of the ADHD. But the question is whether it helps in these cases that letters are jumping within the word or between the words. So what we did was we, work, we, we worked with uh, students and adolescents who get Ritalin for ADHD, and we try to see whether it makes them make fewer transposition errors. So the left, the left column, the one with the pill, is the one with the uh, methylphenidate, and the other one is without methylphenidate, and what you could see is that it has no effect at all. It doesn't affect reading or in letter position dyslexia. It doesn't reduce 
the number of errors that they make, which means that you don't have to push Ritalin in, uh, to every child who has uh, DSA, DSA, right? What you do need to do is to see what the problem is. If it is a problem in a prolonged attention, maybe Ritalin will be helpful, but not in any case. Okay, so this was letter position dyslexia. I now move to a different uh, dyslexia that is called attentional dyslexia. Very good. Okay. Attentional dyslexia, and for this, I want you to participate in a little test. Okay, I'm going to show words on the screen. They will uh, be very brief. It might be either in Hebrew, in, not in Hebrew, in English or in Italian. Okay, and you just tell me what you saw. Ready? Goat, coat, goal, coal. What was it? Goat or coat or goal or coal? Okay, I'll show you in a second. Let's try again, okay? Are you ready? A different pair. Table, cable, table and cable. We'll see in a second. Okay, so remember the first was either coat or goat or coal or goal, and the second was table, cable. Okay, let's try another pair. Are you ready? Toto porto? Porta. Torta. Torto. Porto. Okay. So it's either toto, porto, torta, porta. Okay. Final pair, and then I'll show you what there really was. Okay, are you ready? Bari, Bazi, Bare, Bazi, Base, Bari. Okay. What? What? Okay. Now I'll show you what. Now it will be a bit slower. Okay. The first one was goat and coal. What happened to those who saw goal? Why did you? Why did we see goal? It's not only those who like soccer. Why? Hmm? Yes, the, the letters, some of us saw goal. The letters, the, the, the final letter in the second word moved to the final letter in the first word, right? So we have migrations of letters between words. Again, if someone saw for the second word, coat, it's the same thing. The T moved to the second word. Now it's normal. You are normal. <laughs> it is normal readers in short presentations succeed in identifying the letters. They succeed in putting the letters in the right position within the word. The only thing they cannot do is do letter to word binding, to, to know which letter belongs to which word. And this is why we, we get coat or goal. The second one, remember, it was table, cable. <sighs> it's table with an F in the end. We have E moving to the second word and creating table. What about this one? Torto. Now notice that even if you saw torta, you didn't see trota, right? You saw torta. Why did you see torta? Because you were able to identify the position of the letters within the words. The only thing that you didn't manage, that we didn't manage to do, is to bind the letters to the word, and therefore we got porto or tota. And the final one, was there bari in there? No. <laughs> what we have here again is a ident good identification of the letters, but a good identification of the position within the word, but inability to uh, identify the position, the, which letter belongs to which word, okay? So this is what happens to normal readers, skilled readers in short presentation. But this gives you a hint of how a person with attentional dyslexia feels when we show them words for an unlimited period of time. So they might see these two words for two minutes. Just look at them and then say, yes, I saw there, Bari and Baze. Okay, so this is what happens with attentional dyslexia in an unlimited uh, time. 
and they might have migrations from the first world to the second world, from the second world to the first world, and for, in the two, uh, two directions as well. Okay. Now we already worked with a, a group of children, some of them from Bari and some of them from uh, Milano, together with uh, Claudio Luzzatti and together with Paola Angelelli, um, trying to see whether it is possible to identify attentional dyslexia also in Italian. So you can see here an example uh, of ER. He, he had to read Pirata and under the word pi Pirata, you see, I read via graphing to phoneme conversion. It's Pirata or Pirata? Pirata. And underneath this, it was Matita. And then instead, he read uh, Pirata correctly, but then he read Patita instead of Matita. He read Patita because the P migrated from the first word to the second word. Uh, this is another child, MG. He, he read instead of, he had to read Pena Modo and he read Pena Mondo. The N migrated. Instead of reading Amarezza, the Nuncha, he read Amarenza. Again, the N migrated. And Zvago Velia became Zvalo Velia. The L migrated. Now, when you think about children that you work with who make letter substitution, take a look at the words around the word that they are reading and see whether the letter that they substitute is actually a letter that appears in the same position in the words above it or below it or in to one of the sides. Okay, because it might very well be attentional dyslexia. Letters migrate also from above and from below, from the sides. Okay, another important thing is, like in the previous, in letter position dyslexia, usually when letters migrate, they create existing words. So you didn't uh, make errors that did not create existing words when I showed the words for you very quickly. This is usually also the same with attentional dyslexia. When they make errors, they do not they usually make errors that create another word. Again, let's think about diagnosis. What do we need to do in order to diagnose attentional dyslexia? We have to show several words that if you, if you have a migration of letters between the words, it creates another existing word. So I'll give you some examples in Italian. This is why I think I, uh, we love our job so much. We say that we are working, but actually we think about word pairs that in which when letter migrates between the words, we get another existing word. So for example, if you look at the porta toto that we saw before, you get porta tota. Let's think about the first one. Giro tira can become tiro gira. Mole solo becomes sole molo. Tela velo. Vela, telo, okay? So in this case, once, once you present these words, you are able to expose attentional dyslexia. But also, sometimes, I, th I think it's very, very important just to listen to what the, the individual has to say. You just ask them, what do you feel when you read? And they might tell you, I see all the words jumping in my face, all the letters jumping, everything is jumping, I, s I can't, concentrate on one word. So it's of, often very, very useful just to ask the, the patient, the individual, what they feel. And then you can have some kind of direction to know what is, what is wrong with their reading. I had a child who, said, uh, who sat in my office after she was already 12, and nobody knew what the problem was, and then I realized that she has attentional dyslexia, and I told her, you know, you identify the letters correctly, but they jump between the, le between the words. And she said, of course, I know. So uh, she said, when I, when I need to, even when I need to write something, if I want to read what I'm writing, I have to put my hand, so it doesn't, it, it doesn't interfere with my writing. So often, People know what's, what's bothering them, and we need to ask them. Okay, how do we help? Remember that the problem is, they, they do not have problem in identifying the letters, they do not have problems in identifying the position of the letter within the word. The only problem is that the letters jump between, from other words. So what do we have to do? We just have to hide the other words. One way to do it, 
It's just to present, to cover the words around the, 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 the word that they are reading. So just, again, in a very, very simple way, take a piece of cardboard, cut a little finestrino in the middle of this cardboard, and then ask them to read with this cardboard, and you can see how much their reading improves. I had uh, Tamar, a, a girl who I knew her mother, and her mother said she was uh, 11 and a half, and her mother called me one day and she said, you have to help me. Tamar doesn't want to go to school anymore. She declared that she's not going to school anymore. And we cannot convince her, and we don't know what's wrong. She hasn't been doing homework for the last two years, and now she's not going to school anymore. And I, I told her, okay, bring her to me, and we'll see, I'll talk to her, and I'll give her some tests, and we'll see what's wrong with her. And I saw that she was perfect, except for letters jumping between words. And I told her, can you cut a little finestrino in the cardboard? In the middle, can you do it? She said, well, I'll try, and she cut a little finestrino, and she was reading with this cardboard, and immediately she saw that she was making f much fewer errors. And uh, I gave her the cardboard to take home, and two weeks later, her mother calls me, and I hear that she's really excited, but I don't know if she's crying or she's happy. And I ask, what happened, what happened? And she said, you, do not, you will never believe what I just saw. My, <laughs> my daughter was sitting on the, uh, on, the scale, on, the, on the stairs and reading a book for pleasure. This is something that never happened. She's reading a book for pleasure with this little cardboard. So, and, so, uh, and since then, she agreed to go back to school with her little cardboard. Since then, she has a lot of colors of different cardboards with little finestrini. But she, she, gained, she also gained some self-esteem. She gained some confidence in being able to read once she has this very, very little and very simple uh, aid. Okay? So in this case, again, you see that diagnosis is extremely important in this case. If you know that a child has a problem that results from letters jumping between words, just give them instructions to hide the words around it. Hide it with your hand, hide it with a ruler, hide it with another book. Just give them a chance to read each word separately and they will be able to read better. This is just, a, you can see here, Percentage, percentage of errors. The, the purple is percentage of errors without the finestrino, and the orange is percentage of errors uh, with the finestrino, and you see much fewer. Tamar is the second one from the left. You can see how much she improved in reading with this little finestrino. Okay. Uh, I want to say something about the, again about the relation between comprehension and language and these kinds of dyslexia, letter position dyslexia and attentional dyslexia. Clearly, it's not a problem in, uh, in language, right? And these children, when we test their syntax and lexical retrieval, they have no problem. It's only a problem in reading. But it affects their comprehension. Why does it, their written word comprehension? Why does it affect their comprehension? Because if they read already the stage of the visual analysis, if they read trota as tota, they will understand it as tota. And therefore, they will have difficulties in understanding written text. But if you tell, if you say these words, they will have no problem, right? So if you give them accommodation in exams or in exercises, if you give them accommodations of someone reading to them the text or the test, then they shouldn't have any problem. So in this case, once you know that this is the, the problem, you can help them immensely, either by telling them to read with a finger or with a finestrino, or just by having someone reading to them the text. This is, I will not go into it, but this is just a list of studies that we did showing that children who have letter position dyslexia or attentional dyslexia don't have any problem in phonological awareness or in syntax or in lexical retrieval. Huh? Okay. I'm sorry, I'm going to skip a little bit. Okay. 
Uh, what about surface dyslexia? Remember, surface dyslexia was the dyslexia of. Look here. Can you read what's written here in the presentation? Yes. Okay. These words are not, in, I hope, they are not in your lexicon, right? But still, you were able to read this. How were you able to read this? Because, exactly, from sounds, you did grapheme to phoneme conversion and you converted the letters to their sounds and therefore you were able to read it. This is exactly how children and adults with surface dyslexia read. They convert from grapheme to phonemes, they hear their inner speech, like you did. You hear yourself say, can you read this presentation? And then they understand. In this case, when they read aloud, they will have errors, as we said, like Modena, Modena instead of Modena. But also in comprehension, they might have problems with homophones. Now, the, the final point that I want to stress before I finish is to ask whether all children who have surface dyslexia will have problems in comprehension. And when we look at the model, we say surface dyslexia is a problem in the direct lexical route. So will they have a problem in, in comprehension or not? The crucial point here is where exactly in the lexical route they are impaired. Okay? Just. If they are impaired in the orthographic input lexicon, so the, they do not have access to this lexicon, then in order to understand, they will have to go through the grapheme to phoneme conversion and then to hear what they said and then understand it. Of course, in this case, they will have problems in comprehension of homophones. But what happens and what should we tell students and children who come to us who have a problem here between the two lexicons? Of course, when they read aloud, they will read incorrectly. Instead of reading Modena, they will read Modena. But will they understand correctly? Yes. Why? Because they go, sorry, they go from the visual analysis system to the orthographic input lexicon and from there to semantics. In this case, if they don't read aloud, they just understand, they will understand correctly. So what do we need to tell these children who are in class and have problems when they read aloud? Just don't read aloud. That's the only thing that you should tell them because they understand correctly. And I was working with a child, a child, he was 32 when he came to me, who left school and didn't want to do anything to do with, uh, with reading and he became a, a cook because he thought that he's stupid because this is what they told him in school. If, when he read aloud, he made a lot of errors. Hebrew is a very irregular word, uh, language. So he made a lot of errors in reading aloud. So he thought he was stupid and he just left everything that had to do with the academy or with learning. But when he came to me, I realized that, when he, that this is his point of impairment. So when he understands without reading aloud, he understands perfectly. So the only thing that his teacher had to tell him at this point was just don't read aloud. Just look at the word and understand it and don't read it aloud. And then all this frustration would have been uh, saved from him. So in this case, I, what I'm, I just want to say is with respect to comprehension in these individuals who have surface dyslexia, it is very important to understand again exactly where in the model they are impaired. And then we will know what to do, to work on the lexicon or to tell them just don't read a lot. Okay. So, sorry. So I'm summarizing here. We, have, we saw that there are different seven, there are 17 types of dyslexia. We focused on five or six of them that result from impairments in different position within the reading model. We see that if we know exactly what the characteristics of the different dyslexias are, we know how to diagnose them. For letter position dyslexia, we have to present migratable words. For attentional dyslexia, we have to present words that allow for migration, migrations between the two words. For surface dyslexia, we have to present three-syllable words like Modena. Right? For deep dyslexia, we want to present function words like perché or dal. 
or, or abstract words. So it's very, very crucial that we include the right words in order to be able to identify the dyslexia. And finally, if we want to treat the, the person correctly, we, again, we need to understand what the problem is in order to give them the right treatment. Reading with a finger, not reading aloud, reading with a finestrino. And, if we, uh, and we also saw that there are some important relations between language and reading. For example, those who are impaired in the phonological lexicon will have problems both in speech and in reading, but those who have problems in the orthographic visual analyzer will have problems in understanding what they read, but they will not have problems understanding what they hear. That's it. <laughs>